So teachers have a, a great job. They have uh, the, the, the privilege of bringing in maybe children or teenagers, primary or secondary school, and teaching them something they didn't know. Maybe if you've ever had the, the privilege of maybe teaching someone Irish dancing, for example, you know, so they, they come in and they're all toes turned in and kind of tripping over themselves and then you teach them how to do the, the feet the right direction and how to kick with the legs straight and all this kind of stuff. Or teach them how to play guitar or someone who, you know, can only play football with their right foot and you just teach them how to kick with the left as well. Whatever it may be. Whenever you teach, if you can ever teach someone something, it's... It's great. Not, it's not that you make, it makes you feel like super powerful, I'm amazing, I can, I can show people things, but you see somebody develop, you know, you see someone grow. There's a great satisfaction in that. You know, teaching anyone anything, right? Just when you see someone learn something that they didn't know beforehand, there's just a, a great kind of a, a satisfaction in that, to see someone progress, right? See someone move forward. Uh, one could imagine, as a teacher, if, if, if some of the class were struggling, say, for example, with their five times tables or with spelling the word rhythm, okay, R-H-T-Y. So, so they, you know, they're struggling with it. And then, and then the teacher were to say, guys, it's, it's, it's not important. It's not important that you know how to spell rhythm or acknowledgements or any of these words. It's, it's not important that you know how. It's, what's important is that you're a good person inside. So your five times tables, you don't need those either. Okay, just whatever you feel, just whatever number comes into your head, that, that, that's, that's good, that's fine. Someone would say, if, I, if anyone were to say that, you'd say that's, that's blatantly irresponsible, sorry. Um, you know, if you're going to be a, a nurse or a doctor and administer uh, five cc's or 50 cc's uh, of an injection, you know, 500 cc's will make them explode. You know, you, you have to get your five times tables right or you're gonna hurt someone. Uh, so we have to know what we're doing. Right, if we're going to do things responsibly. We do have to know how to spell, right? Right, younger generation today, right? Great is not spelled G-R-8, right? It's G-R-E-A-T, is that clear? <laughs> All right, so, uh, so it's absolutely detrimental in, in the teaching sphere, in the field of teaching, to say, what I'm supposed to teach you isn't necessary, okay? That's just craziness, that's, uh, I mean, we do have to learn to walk, we do have to learn to spell, we do have to learn how to do whatever it is, our, our, our maths or our history, we have, we, have, we have to know what we're talking about, otherwise things start to fall apart. Okay, if we jump forward, I'm jumping to kind of a different sphere, the sphere of, of, of morality, the, the sphere of, of faith. Uh, while it, it may be that back in the day, uh, there may have been an excessive dwelling on, on the law, on the rules, if one were to say today that the rules and laws of our faith now are so they're entirely unnecessary as long as we you know as long as we're good make up everything for yourself afterwards that's really really dangerous it's really really dangerous because our, our job as as faithful people is is also to to be missionary you know go make disciples of all nations that the lord gives us this uh, this responsibility i love that this line from from romans 10 so how are they to call on one in whom they haven't believed? So how are they supposed to call on the Lord if, if they've never believed in him? And how are they supposed to believe in one that they've, of whom they've never heard? How are they supposed to believe in Jesus if they've never heard of him? And how will they hear about Jesus without someone to proclaim him? Okay, so someone has to speak about Jesus and proclaim who Jesus is so that people can believe in him so that people can call on him when they need him. So if we say mission is unnecessary, you know, we don't need to go out there and preach the gospel anymore. At the end of the day, people are, you know, they're, they're, people are good, more or less, you know, they're, they're, they're doing their best with, with the cards they've been dealt. And so we're all effectively going to heaven anyway, just different routes, different, different roads, but we're all going to heaven. See, Jesus never says that, not, not once, ever. And he does kind of, in our gospel today, suggest that there is an alternative to heaven, where people go. So this is, this is very real. This isn't, you know, preconciliar theology. This is what Jesus says. This is what Jesus says. So we have, we have an incredible responsibility. And then, as I say, the, the, the joy that we have as teachers, seeing people 
learn how to play guitar, learn, learn how to Irish dance, learn how to, to do their, their maths. We get to see people get closer to God. There is no greater mission. There is no more satisfying uh, privilege than, than to draw people closer to the Lord. Why is that? Because no matter how high a person can kick in Irish dancing, no matter how quick people can recite their five times tables, in heaven, if a person gets there because of your example, because of your prayer, they will be grateful to you forever. So 10,000 years, we're just getting started. You know, we're just getting started into eternity after 10,000 years. Okay, so when you, if, if, someone, if a soul is saved because of us, because of our example, because of your good parenting, because of your, maybe your, your, your suffering for your, your child or your parish or your brother or sister or whatever it may be, all this, this, these silent tears and silent sacrifices, and because of that, a soul is saved, there is nothing, nothing greater. There is no greater privilege than to help guide a soul to God. You know, and to, to see the work of God in someone, to see how, how, how the Spirit acts and reacts and guides and forms and heals uh, a soul. And, and in some way that was connected to, to you. Again, we're not, we're not we're no one's saviour. But we do have to witness to the faith that we have so that people can believe it. Again, if we don't preach it, if we don't preach the faith, if we don't preach who Jesus is, people won't call on him. They won't know, they don't believe in him. If they don't believe in him, they can't call on him. So we have this in incredible, incredible privilege and possibility in place in our hands. And so what do we do with it? Where to from here? What do we do with this, with this great grace of being able to, to witness to Christ? We do have to be aware of the other voices out there. Like there as I say, there are voices that say, well, sure, look, everyone goes straight to heaven. And if everyone goes straight to heaven, that means none of us need grace. It means none of, us, none of us actually need a saviour. means none of us need the Eucharist. None of us need confession. None of us need anything. We're grand. Stay doing what you're doing. In fact, do more of it. Because you're grand. You're holy anyway. We're all going to heaven. That's insanity. <laughs> That's just plain insanity. Because, I mean, when we dig a little deeper into people's lives and families and their hearts, there's hurt. There's pain caused by the actions of other people. That's not indifferent. So, like, this, this is reality. Like, people make mistakes. People do things they shouldn't. I do. I will need confession. I need confession now. Uh, I'll be going to confession soon, hopefully. So, uh, so we, we, all, we all need God's forgiveness, all of us. But for me to say, just because I'm a priest, I'm, I'm holy, I'm going to heaven, that's, that's just, that's, sorry, that's just pride. That's not true. I have to, I have to work at this, too. Or for us to say, it's like, imagine someone saying, I have a cure for depression. Watch this. Depression doesn't exist. There we go. We're all free. We're all happy. We're all free. It's excellent. No more, no more, need, no more need for counseling and all of these pros. And it's fine. Just, just, cure, just cure depression. It doesn't exist. <laughs> like, just the insanity of it. Like, you know, I've just found a cure for sin. Sin doesn't exist. There we go. The only problem is we believe the second one. Sin doesn't exist. Great. Excellent. We're free. We're free of the shackles of sin. No, no, no. Sin, sin actually exists. It, it still exists and it still hurts people. And it still hurts our relationship with God. And it still risks heaven. So we're not freeing people by telling them sin doesn't exist. No more than we'd be freeing people telling them that cancer doesn't exist. Or depression doesn't exist. Or that's just insanity. These things are real. They exist and they hurt people. But, but that's, see, that's not where our story ends. Our, our story doesn't end, never ends with sin. Never ends with condemnation. It ends with, here's the problem and here is the solution. So here's the difficulty. Sin, sin exists and pain exists and all grief and, and, and illness and all these things exist, absolutely. And here is the solution. This is our faith. Our faith is a faith of the Alleluia. It's a joyful faith. It's a really happy faith. Because our faith is a faith of redemption. Our faith is a faith that has, where we recognize that Jesus has overcome sin, overcome death, and overcome evil. So we're not stuck in this pit of misery. Jeepers, who would want to be part of that kind of a faith? 
No, we're redeemed. We're saved. The, all that grace is available to us. So it's, this is a good thing. But saying that we don't need any of this grace and redemption because we're already good, that's just craziness. Look at the world. Look at the newspapers. Look at your news feeds. There is hurt and there are problems out there due to people's actions. Otherwise known as sins. This is real. And the Lord says, like, even imagine like, what, what the Lord is saying here. Imagine how, imagine how this sounded to Jewish ears. If your virtue goes no deeper than that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get to heaven. Now, scribes and Pharisees, these are the religious of the day. So these are the ones who knew scripture. Obviously, they could read and write. Many of the people couldn't. So these were some of the few people who, who would have known what we call the Old Testament, the Law of the Prophets, the Psalms. Uh, they would have known them. And then Jesus is saying, if your virtue doesn't go any deeper than theirs, you won't get to heaven. And you can imagine the apostles going, but they're the holy ones, surely. If they're not getting into heaven, uh, what chance do we stand? But yeah, it's, not, it's, not, it's not about head. It's not about your head. It's not your head that gets you into heaven. It's not, it's not what you know gets you into heaven. It's what you do. It's what you do. And today, today we have the next 12 hours, 13 hours before bedtime to do something amazing, to help people get to heaven through our prayers, through our work offered up out of love, through our joy, through our witness, through our selflessness, through striving for virtue. We have the chance to be part of this absolutely phenomenal mission of getting people to heaven. So we ask the good Lord today to guide each one of us in our actions and in our thoughts. Lord, that we may not miss one single opportunity to witness to your love and to your healing in our lives. Amen.